Um, welcome everybody. Um, thanks very much. Uh, there's some nice names there that I recognise. Uh, and thanks very much for inviting me, Simon, to be your first Zoom speaker for uh, for a new era um, in the Kentfield Club. Um, so I'm I'm really chuffed. And as a Kentfield Club member, um, I'm particularly uh, impressed by switching on to the new technology. So I'm here to talk about Vinters Valley Nature Reserve. And uh, bear with me and I'll just share my screen and with luck. Uh, we'll be able to get onto the right one and I will be able to talk to you from there. Uh, there we go. Let's go back. Right. Okay. If I just shrink that down. Okay. That should be okay. So you should be able to see, hopefully everybody should be able to see the screen. Okay. Uh, which has got a nice picture of uh, Vinters, the story of a Kentish estate. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about how Vinters Park uh, transferred from being a Victorian estate to a nature reserve. And uh, we'll go through a little bit about the history of the land, what it was before the nature reserve, before it was a nature reserve, how it became a nature reserve, um, how the, 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 the charity that runs it is set up, uh, a little bit about the management of it in general terms. And because it's the Kent Field Club, we'll go into the species list that we have here because although it's an urban nature reserve you'll see we have quite an extensive um, species list uh, for the nature reserve and then we'll look in in a couple of the conservation areas and we'll go into a bit more depth uh, as to how we manage it and why we manage it and what the purpose of the nature reserve is some of you may have visited the nature reserve both independently but i know there was a kent, kent field club meeting because i remember going to it in 2013 um, so without further ado, I will whiz on. And for those of you that don't know where the Nature Reserve is, um, it's on the edge of Maidstone in the northeast corner of Maidstone. And this is junction seven of the M20. So this is the bottom of Detlin Hill. Um, and so we've got Pennington Heath area of Maidstone, uh, Grove Green um, and Vinters Park uh, is there. So you can see um, I've gone and put in red what is the boundary of the nature reserve? So you can see it's sort of quite a thinnish sort of shape. Um, it's actually 90 acres, uh, but it's wedged. It's in, a, it's in a sea of development. So we've got development to the right, development to the left. We've got a school and playing field, uh, a railway line, the A20, another major road here. So you can see we're, we're really trapped in into an area of sort of um, uh, housing. It didn't used to be like this, uh, but that's the sort of size it was. Um, this was owned, the whole estate used to be following the pink line around here. This was the whole of the estate when it was just a, 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 a housing, a, a, a Victorian estate. So that's where it is. So we're a local, local urban green space. And since lockdown, we're a very busy local urban green space um, with COVID coming in. And as you can imagine, with that many houses sort of spread all around here, we are the local go to green space for so many people that live there. And that has been the case, uh, particularly April and May. Uh, but even since November, when we went into the uh, sort of second lockdown, um, it's been really busy and what's been really important I've been very impressed is so many people that live around there locally have got back in touch with nature a year ago you know I saw okay it's a green space and I have a lot of dog walkers but they used to be in the majority now there are a lot more families out there there are a lot more youngsters that are coming to discover nature and it's on their doorstep and that's what one of the purposes of Vinters is there for. So it's been it's been brilliant to see. And I'm really chuffed to see so many people now using it. We're open 365 days a year. You can't actually shut it. There are five main entrances um, and uh, you know, anybody can walk in there tw 24 hours a day. We do have a sign up um, to say uh, that it's closed during the hours of darkness. Uh, and that's because last year we had a bit of a problem with um, juveniles uh, and so we got the police to sort of do some uh, patrols around there but generally anybody can go around there um, I mentioned earlier it's 90 acres or 36 hectares in size 70% of it has public access but importantly 
30 percent of it is closed off for conservation the only people who can get in there is if you're invited by me um, um, and that's where we do a lot of our conservation work um, and that is where in 2013 a lot of the uh, Kent Field Club uh, members uh, finished up at um, as I say it's got a history it's a historic garden and parkland but it's reverted back to nature and it continues to revert back to nature you'll see as I go through through that there'll be areas where we'll say well, how do we manage it well we just leave it alone and we don't really do too much to it but that's that's its history in, in, in a short nutshell uh, that it was a historic garden and parkland and we're letting it go back to nature and let nature take back control you can see from the uh, uh, from the logo here that um, Vincent's Valley Nature Reserve we call it Mateson's Hid Hidden Gem I get so many people that the first time they go there they say to me do you know I've lived in Maidstone for 30 years and I never knew this was here and, and that and they and the joy when they found it uh, and then they come back again and, and that's part of the beauty um, 30 years is because it's managed by a charity and the charity that manages it has been going since 1991 but I'll talk a little bit more in the history but we're in our 30th year of celebration of this being managed as a nature reserve so uh, let's sort of whiz back a bit and let's have a look at the past management of the uh, of the land and what it was uh, and there's a picture of a, a gentleman with a wig on so there's been a house at Vinters uh, in in the land that Vinters Valley Nature Reserve uh, occupies since 1343 well I say there's been a house since there there was a house up until about the late 1950s 1960s and then, then the house was knocked down but I'll come on to that but basically for 600 years the land was occupied as a as an estate of landed gentry and, and a gentleman called Roger de Vinter bought the land from the church and that's the first recorded house in 1343. I'm skipping on a bit in the history because I, I'm mindful the Kent Field Club is not a Hist history society so I want to sort of move on quite swiftly but between 1343 and 1782 there was a succession of many owners some of them had it for sort of 10-20 years some of them it was in the family and it was passed from uh, through several generations but uh, the interesting thing for the history side of it is in 1782 a gentleman called James Watman II purchased Vinter's Manor and the land as it was then and those of you who know your history of Maidstone, Watman uh, was very famous for paper making, and there is uh, still Watman's paper making company around, but it's not owned by the Watman family. But James Watman was one of the first people to, and in fact, he, him and his father invented a new way of having paper, which so that it was a lot smoother. And as he was the first one in the market, he stole and marched on everybody and made an absolute packet. And having made a load of money he did what everybody did in those days they went and bought themselves a country pile and then pile, piled the money into it so James Watman so that's where the history comes in and anybody who visits the nature reserve it's the Watman and the Victorian part of the history that they're very interested in so the early Wat Watman's years he bought the house in 1782 spent the first 10 years or so um, spending all his money doing the house up extending it making it habitable and making it a plush area where he can invite he could invite the good and the uh, and the wealthy of Maidstone to come and stay with him in 1794 um he he sold the business and had loads more money and extended the boundaries of the land and bought more land so that uh, in the um can i have oh, there we go um so that at one stage the Watman family owned all the land around there and they had about 600 acres uh, in total so a lot of it was farmed um, but they had a much bigger area than what's left with the nature reserve now however skipping on a bit in 1797 uh, James Watman II uh, commissioned uh, Humphrey Repton who was a well-known landscape gardener uh, and uh, drawer of lands um, to redesign the lands and emphasize some of the open vistas and pastoral scenes uh, in 17 uh, in, in so that was 1797 so Repton produced what he would call was his red book which was his book on, on what to do with the land and how he would recommend that you improved it so he sent James Watman the red book in 1798 plus the bill and James Watman saw the bill and, and died um, using a bit of artistic license there 
but James Watman II died. And then his son, who was also called James, you can see they were very imaginative on names, but James Watman III uh, instigating a lot of Repton's ideas, uh, didn't use Repton's um, uh, staff to do that, he employed, employed local labour because it was cheaper. Um, but uh, James, Rock, James Watman III was very much the first Repton, uh, the first uh, Watman to start to instigate some of Repton's ideas as to what a, a, a wealthy landowner uh, should look like in, a, in the land and the, uh, and, and the uh, house. So if we just whiz on, uh, hang on. Yes. So this was Repton's idea, um, very much to do with what was going on at that time of the year, uh, that time of uh, that era, the end of the, it's the Georgian era, George III on the crown. So uh, the ideas were that you had open, majestic views, fine parkland trees, and uh, you got rid of anything that was in the way that sport your view. And to some extent, he was aping Moat Park um, just across the valley. Um, uh, and this is where I think they got a lot of their ideas for and why they wanted it to uh, be a grand manor with wonderful parkland. Um, there was probably a bit of one-upmanship going on. But that was Repton's idea. It was to open up the landscape, particularly around the house, and have uh, a nice pastoral scene of tranquility. Uh, and, and, and we're still the recipient of that because there are a lot of the trees that were planted around those times are now very mature trees and, and uh, great uh, wildlife uh, uh, trees. So the Watman legacy of the land. Well, James Watman III passed away and, and his son came along and guess what? His name was James as well. So he was James Watman IV. And he became in 1852 the local MP. He was the local squire. He was a gentleman farmer. And so we have a situation where James Watman II made all the money. James Watman III started to invest it. And James Watman IV continued it. So he expanded the estate and the house, spent more money on it. When he became an MP, um, he needed to impress everybody. So he built another extension on the house in 18. 52 and there were things like garden parties and the lake was a boat in lake and of course in the mid-victorian era era uh, the way that you could impress everybody and indicate your wealth was uh, you couldn't get hold of a 60 inch plasma tv but you could get hold of garden exotics so he would pay for people to bring back um uh, examples of flora and fauna from around the world and if you go around the nature reserve now you will see examples of that you will see some uh california redwood trees uh, coastal redwood trees wellingtonias there are some palms and there are some bamboo and we leave them in because they are part of the history of of, of the land and and whilst their wildlife potential is not as great as the natives it is part of the history and it's what people like so as we saw, um, Repton's idea was to have parkland trees and a lot of the tree planting that went on was in the early 1800s, 1800 to 1820. So some of the majestic trees that you see at the Nature Reserve now are about 200 years old. There was also a vegetable garden. Uh, Tesco's hadn't been invented, so they couldn't drop down to the supermarket. And so they grew a lot of their own vegetation. And we do have an area called the Kitchen Garden, which is part of the history of the land. So that's very much the Watman legacy. Um, this is a map in 1869, and it gives you an indication of what it looked like there. And it hasn't changed a great deal in basic structural terms. The house is no longer there. But this is the area called the kitchen garden. This is this road here is called Newcut Road. And although this has been straightened out, most people that come to the Nature Reserve park in Lodge Road here, and they enter the Nature Reserve along this track here, and they normally walk down along this way, walk over where the house used to be to a terrace area, and then they head down towards the lake. And this area here is the main lake. This is the main valley going up to the crematorium. And you can see you've got a wooded valley on either side. This is now occupied by houses, but the base, and this is what was a cow field, but is our main conservation area. The woodland that is on the edge of a new cut road is still there. 
Uh, and this area is now where Mason Studios, the TV studios are. But in broad terms, it's still uh, an old house and kitchen garden area. The valley and the lake and the wooded sides are still there. So it hasn't changed a great deal in over 160 odd years, uh, but that's in simple terms. Now, like all families, uh, one member of the family makes all the money. The second member of the family that inherits it, realizes what their father put into it and carries on making money. And then the grandson goes and loses it all. And that's what happened uh, to the Watman family. James Watman IV, um, born in 1813, died in 1887. By then, um, they were not as wealthy as they had been a um, hundred years earlier. Um, his wife uh, continued to live in the house, but in 1912, she died. And so uh, James Watman IV, his two daughters, uh, Miss Louisa and Miss Florence, moved to Newnham Court. So they moved out of the house because it was too expensive. And they moved into uh, a farm cottage there. Well, it wasn't really a cottage, it was a big house. But it's behind Knockart's Garden Centre. There's, there's, a, there's a house there. You can see it as you come off the motorway and look towards your left. Um, there's a house there, and that's Newnham Court. Um, so that's the area that, uh, that they moved into. They then rented the house out and there was a series of uh, tenants that rented into the house. Uh, come the Second World War, then there was army occupation of the house. Um, if you walk around there and if you came in, a, if you came in, uh, in 2013, I would have shown you some bomb craters. Um, so there was a little bit of army occupation, but basically, you know, the house was not what it was. The land was not really properly being managed. Uh, and in 1950, Miss Louisa, the last direct descendant of the Watmans, dies. And at that stage, the estate was all split up. So in 1954, and the Royal Star Hotel in Maidstone, there was a big auction and the whole land was sold off. Uh, and a lot of it was bought, bought up um, for housing. Um, so the area where Vinters Park is now was bought up and Grove Green. Although, and although it took nearly 30 years to develop that, in housing, that was when the land was bought. Um, in the late 50s, the house burnt down. So um, the house, nobody really looked after it. Um, horrendous uh, costs to keep those sort of houses going in the, in the late 50s, early 60s. Nobody wanted to spend any money on it. So they just left it to go and rack and ruin. So the local um, homeless people often used to go there and uh, the owners of the land sort of supplied them with liquor. Uh, matches and lo and behold one day it burned down. Um, it was then knocked down, the, the, survived, the bits that survived the fire were knocked down um, and then in the 1960s when, the, when they started building the houses and they needed to get rid of rubble then they dumped it all on the housing estate and uh, on the um, house uh, area and the ground. So where the kitchen garden is there's actually quite a lot of builders rubble underneath there which is useful for sort of wildlife and different plants. But that's broadly the um, history of the Watman family and and the land sort of thing. Um, as I said, I, I could carry on for another hour on the history of that, but it's not a history talk, so I will whiz on. But if you've got questions you want to do, then please drop them in there and, you, and I'll happily answer any questions that people have got on the history. But that's broadly what happened to the land. So we have a Victorian estate and manor house that is looked after, uh, and money is spent, uh, to make it look like a landscape garden with, um, uh, excuse me, with uh, farmland surrounding it. But most of the nature reserve that you go in now is where the house and the gardens were. So all the, all the land that was farmed has been sold off as, as housing. And what we're left with is just the house and the surrounding gardens that the family and the Watman family would have walked around. So how did it become a nature reserve? Well, um, when the builder had built all his houses and got the land he wanted, what he was left with was a steep sided valley, which was obviously going to cost too much money to build houses with. So he sold it back to the KCC. So the nature reserve has two, two landlords. The bulk of the land, we are tenants of the KCC. And then the northern end near the crematorium, then Maxton Borough Council bought that, Put the crematorium on it um, and we have ownership of part or we are tenants of part of that but for all intensive purposes 
80-85% of the land, we are tenants of the KCC. Um, why did it become a nature reserve? Because in the late 60s, a lot of people were interested in nature and two people were really important in making it a nature reserve, Donal and Leda McGrory. They moved into Maidstone in Boxley Road and Leda was really, really into nature. And Leda is still alive and I still go and see Leda. And she was the guiding light. Her heart went into that nature reserve. And it became a nature reserve because of her heart and her love of the land. Donal, her husband, became a counsellor and he provided the practical knowledge to get it made into a nature reserve. He was able to uh, get the wheels going uh, and say, look, we don't want it to be just dumped with rubbish and old cars there. We want it as a nature reserve. So local pressure built up to make it a nature reserve. And it started to become formally a nature reserve in 1986. Uh, Leader was employed by the KCC, but it wasn't until 1991 that the Vinters Valley Park Trust, or a registered charity, accepted the first of a 99 year lease on the land. And they got the first 36, um, uh, 36 acres to have it as a nature reserve. So the local pressure to say, we don't want it to be built on, we want it to be for nature, started to. Uh, uh, bring dividends and through Donald's uh, sort of badgering of um, Mason Borough councillors and KCC people, um, they got the first 36 uh, uh, acres of the land. Uh, Donald was never one to say no uh, and he wasn't one to sit on his laurels. So over the next six years, he promptly forever kept turning up in the council offices saying, I want another bit of land. And so by, um, by about 1996, um, the 90 acres that we've now got as the nature reserve uh, it was all as a nature reserve. So we've got about five different parcels of land, all uh, with leases due to run out uh, in 2090 to 2095. And it, it is in the lease that it must be a nature reserve, with the exception of one area which the KCC hold uh, a, a, a covenant, if they wish, to turn it into education purposes. But um, as you will see, as I carry on with the chat, I don't think that's likely to happen. And of course, from the KCC's point of view, they don't have to pay for its upkeep. Um, the charity that uh, that looks after it has to has to pay for its upkeep. So um, looking at the present, how is it managed? This is the management of the reserve. There are, it's a registered charity, as I mentioned, there are two committees. There are the trustees committee. The trustees are the legal guardian of the charity. They are responsible to ensure that it uh, that it keeps going. They're ensure they're 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 responsible to make sure there's enough money to keep it going. The management committee are responsible for the management of the land as a nature reserve, and they employ me as a warden for thirty hours a week, um, and I'm responsible for managing it on a day to day basis. Uh, but I report and am a member of the management committee. So the management committee make decisions on how the land is to be managed, for what types of nature and how it is all done. But we report into the trustees committee, uh, uh, you know, they hold the purse strings and they are the legal guardians of it. Now, everybody is a volunteer there with the exception of me. I am the only paid employee they have. So most nature reserves, particularly if they're urban uh, areas, they're either owned by the council and if you're lucky you'll get some council employees come along on an ad hoc basis or they'll be managed by a local volunteer group of which the volunteers have to do all the work. Vinters is unusual in that the volunteers do all the administrative work uh, to a large extent but I'm paid to do all the manual work and bring ideas to them and I'm very much the ideas man and um, I also have volunteers that help me out to do the, the, the look after the nature. So I have a, what is called a, a Tuesday and a Thursday gang of, of guys that are usually guys and a couple of girls as well that help me in the managing of the land. And I haven't had them since the 1st of November, so I've had to do it all myself. So that's where it is. How do we finance it? It comes from local finance. We don't just get grants. Boxy Parish Council are really good to us. Uh, we also get the odd grant from members, members grants from Mates Borough Council and KCC, but not much. But we spend a lot of time getting to know the local residents. So we have a Friends of the Park scheme. We offer adopt a bird box, adopt a bat box, adopt a tree, so that people can contribute to nature. Um, and they can 
uh, and and contribute in that way. A lot of the dog walkers, um, we run a, a friend scheme and we encourage all the dog walkers to, to join that. Now, if you have a, an urban area, a lot of these, a lot of urban areas sort of say, oh, come and become a member for five pound a year. You and the family can be members. No, that's not enough money. That won't keep the nature reserve going. So the dog walkers, we encourage them to pay 50 pounds a year to walk around their, walk around their public areas with their dog. Now, you might think 50 pounds is a lot of money, but if you're walking your dog around there at least once a day, as most of them are, it works out at 15 pence a dog walk. And that is not expensive. I do get people say, I'm retired, I can't afford this, whilst they're reading the Daily Mail that cost them a pound. Um, but we do encourage people to do that. And we have about 120 people that are supporters of the Nature Reserve. On top of that, we have other people who adopt trees, boxes, bat boxes and bird boxes. And the one thing I would say since lockdown, I've picked up, we have picked up an awful lot more people adopting trees, bird boxes and bat boxes. It's how people want to react and be part of nature. We, we just put some notices up saying, look, you know, we need help to manage the nature reserve as always. But people have, have said we, they want to adopt. Can we adopt a bird box? Can we adopt this? Can we adopt a tree? And we're tapping into this. So whatever you feel about lockdown, people have really drifted into nature. It's given them the solace that they're seeking. And one of the ways they want to be part of nature is they want to adopt trees, birds, boxes and bat boxes. And they want to help me. I've had so many requests for people. I'd love to be one of your volunteers. Um, so, you know, people are really, really getting into nature. If you're if you're part of an organisation and you haven't realised this, I'm telling you, from my experience in the urban area I'm in, a lot of the people that live around there have said, I've had so many emails saying it has been my saviour to be able to walk around the nature reserve and I want to help it remain as a nature reserve. So we're working heavily on that. OK, I said we manage it. And this is what we have. We have a management plan. Um, the management plan is reviewed every year and broadly it is my bible as to how to manage it and these are the different bits of the nature reserve and you can see there are actually 17 areas and each area is managed in a different way there are different habitats to manage there are grasslands woodlands water scrub some have limited access to disturbance so as i mentioned to you area number 11 that's our, one of our main conservation areas where when you came in 2013, most of you went to. That was a cow field for 200 years. That was a cow field. I'll talk you through the history of it a little bit later. So that area is not open to the public. All of most of area number three is, is the wooded valley. And that's we don't close that off to the public, but you can't really get in there. Uh, nature's nature's barbed wire is called bramble and I allow bramble to grow where I don't want people to go. Uh, so that area is called non-intervention. Non-intervention is a really valuable management tool to us. You know, there's a temptation to get a power tool and string things out and cut things down. Now, in areas of the reserve, I have to do that for public safety. But the best thing anybody can do is to take the power tools off me and leave nature to get on with it. So this area in the, all this area here, this is woodland area. I doubt I go into that more than, I don't know, four or five times a year. Um, number 16 is a marshland area. I go into that about twice a year. Area number seven between this set of steps and this set of, uh, and this set of steps here, that's all woodland as well. I don't think I go into that more than about twice a year. Area number one is next to the crematorium. Crematorium's here. Area number one is a woodland, uh, lower filling pits wood. That's closed off to the public and um, uh, we coppice in there. Um, so we're, it's part of actually part of our deeds that we have to coppice. So we copy so members of the public don't go into that. That's undisturbed. Area number four, that's part of Maidstone Borough Council's land and they don't want public in, people in there. Uh, and that's also managed for conservation. The whole of the middle of area number five, McGrory's Meadow, that's got a pond in there. That's managed for conservation and people don't go in there. So there are, there's about 70 percent of the area the public can wander around. But there's about 30 percent, quite large chunks of areas where they don't go in. And a large chunk and some of those we don't even manage. We just leave them alone. Um, we're not 
you know, it's, it's just letting nature take its course. And again, that's quite unusual in an urban setting. Um, there's a temptation to turn it into a, into a whopping great garden and manage it as if you're managing a garden. And that's not what it is. It is managed for nature. Vinters Valley Nature Reserve, unlike some of the other green spaces around there, is not managed for people, it's managed for nature. But we encourage people, in fact, we love people to come, provided they respect nature. And that's what we very much look to do. So that gives you a little bit of it in general terms, how we're managing it. So what's the purpose of the nature reserve? Um, okay, in April 2011, Bolivia passed the world's first laws granting all of nature equal rights to humans. They include a right to life, to exist, the right to pure water, clean air, the right not to be polluted, the right to balance the needs. At Vintas Valley Nature Reserve, we put these ideals in, in place. So as I said to you, you know, there's large chunks of the area where, yeah, I know you'd like to go in there, but we're not going in there because that is for nature. A bit like Yosemite National, National Park in that, you know, it's for nature and, the, and then we regulate whether the humans can go in there. Second purpose, everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in, to pray in, where nature may heal, cheer and give strength to body and soul. And that's been never truer than during the lockdown. As I said to you, so many people have said to me, this has been my saviour and this has uh, come, come to pass. And the third purpose, we've got to teach people about nature. In the end, we will only conserve what we love, we will only love what we understand, and we will only understand what we are taught. And so we're about trying to teach people about nature, not in a condescending way, but to get them to be part of nature, to, to just marvel at the joys of it and then want to learn about it. But particularly important is the next generation. And we have a lot of school groups normally uh, in the last year we haven't, but normally we have a lot of school groups come in, a lot of youth groups come in. It's not overly prescribed. I just do what I, I just tell, I just show them what I used to do as a child. And we basically just sort of say, well, go wandering and come back and show me what you found that you just love. Uh, and and that's unusual as well. Um, sometimes I think we're a little bit over prescriptive as to how we try and teach people about nature, particularly the next generation. Whereas if you just give kids and say, right, you can go running around, and come back and show me what you found uh, and what you love and what gives you joy. Um, then I think then we will encourage people to love nature. And if they're going to save the planet, they've got to start loving it and they've got to discover that love for themselves. And that's what very much we do. So we are uh, an urban nature uh, site, um, but we offer a future for conservation. Uh, I'll go into that in a bit more detail for you. Okay, um, Kent Field Club. So I thought I'd better tell you what we've been doing in the way of recording, um, because I guess that you would probably be a little bit more interested in that than some of the history elements. So recording um, started in earnest around not long after the trust had got hold of the uh, nature reserve. So around about 1993, there was some uh, studious work done to try and work out what have we got in the nature reserve, what species had we got. And there were a number of uh, recorders of note that we must, you know, I must mention because these people were so important. The first one was Eric Philp. Eric became, um, uh, Eric became a, uh, a member of the management committee and Eric being Eric, he just went around there and over a year or two just recorded everything that he could find. And we couldn't have asked for a better recorder somebody who knew just about everything. And so a lot of the, uh, uh, the species list uh, comes from Eric. The second person that's uh, uh, worthy of mention is uh, 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 Peter Kirby of the um, Kent Butterfly and Moth Group. Peter is a local resident. And in fact, his grandfather used to uh, hunt on the land um, with a shotgun, shooting rabbits. Uh, when uh, Miss Louisa was alive. So Peter's, uh, Peter and his family absolutely love the nature reserve. They live on its doorstep. And Peter's passion, amongst many other things, is butterflies and moths. And so thanks to him, he's done an awful lot of moth trapping. Uh, and so our knowledge of butterflies and moths is, is, is second to none. Uh, it's fantastic. 
uh, <coughs> Dr. John Puckett, um, John from the Kent uh, back group. Uh, John is another a stalwart uh, who's put in so many hours for the nature reserve in recording bats. He comes in usually twice every winter, sometimes during the summer, uh, and records everything that he sees because we've got two bat hibernation sites. Uh, areas. Um, John got into the nature reserve because his uh, mother-in-law uh, lived on the Vinters Park estate and somebody discovered their bats in, in one of the houses on the estate. So John knew that they, you know, they must be coming locally and since there was a great big lake in the nature reserve that must be where they were feeding. And um, with John's help and the uh, car, uh, the uh, Kent Underground Research Group um, John discovered two hibernation areas, one's a barrel bridge and one is an old ice house and with uh, the group of, uh, with their help, uh, we managed to save those in 1994 and protect them and stop people going in uh, uh, and damaging them for bats, so that's there. Uh, Jeff, um, hello Jeff, I did see your name on there. Um, Jeff uh, was a stalwart on bees and wasps and uh, uh, discovered a number of uh, bees and, and helped tremendously to increase our knowledge of bees and wasps that are in the nature reserve. Uh, and lastly, uh, a gentleman that I uh, discovered, or he came and introduced himself to me in 2012 when we had an AGM, Howard Bentley. Howard, uh, you may know he is a member of the Kent Field Club, but he is also uh, part of the UK Diptera Society. Howard lives locally about a 10 minute drive away. And he came to me in the nature reserve at the AGM and said, hello, my name's Howard, I'm interested in flies. Um, and uh, uh, would it be possible, is it at all possible I could go into the nature reserve and see what flies you've got? I said, of course you can, Howard. I said, would you prefer to go somewhere where when you were bending down looking at flies, you didn't have a dog sticking its nose up your backside? And would you like to go somewhere privately where you're not gonna be interfered with? And, he, and so I took him into our conservation area. And I said, Howard, you can go anywhere in here. You just come whenever you like. Just the only deal is, can you just share your records with us? Uh, and and he went on and he couldn't believe that I, you know, here was a nature reserve that just said you could do what you like, Howard, but just share share your records with us, and I'll put you in an area where you're not going to be interfered with, so you can go looking for flies to your heart's content. Uh, and he subsequently became a member of the management committee, and through his knowledge, it enabled us to manage the nature reserve for Diptra in a different way. So those five people there have been other people as well but those are people of note that you know really we have to thank so much for the species list that we've got in the nature reserve so as at the 31st of december this is the species list that we have at the moment listed um uh, so we've got 1671 species animal species 1200 uh, 1277 fungi three that is not correct that is all we've got on the species list. Now, I know there are more than three fungi uh, species in there. So that's something for us to update this, uh, this particular uh, year. Uh, and plant species, we've got 391. So we're an urban nature reserve. I'm sure there are other urban areas that uh, have got more species than that. And there will be other uh, nature reserves that have got less species than that. But that's not a bad effort for an urban area of which we've done it totally on the back of volunteer effort, no professional input at all. Um, and we've relied on the recording uh, groups and many of the recorders that have come in uh, have come from the Kent Field Club. And I just, you know, I must thank you all for coming and uh, and taking a joy and spending an afternoon or, or a day or just a couple of hours wandering around the nature reserve. It's been a tremendous help to us, uh, particularly so. So if we look in a bit more in the plant species list, um, that breaks down sort of mosses, liverworts, a number of non-flowering plants. I'll put the number of trees in brackets. So there are 15 non-flowering plants of which six of them are trees. And um, there are 338 recorded flowering plants of which 43 of them are trees. I put the trees in because um, the reserve is, because of the Watman's effort of doing all the planting in the year 1800 to 1820, the trees are particularly important because a lot of them are really mature or veteran trees now and are doing really well. So that, that gives you an idea of the number of plants that we have um, sort of there, uh, we've got. Okay, so this is the, um, this is the animal list. Uh, and I've tried to break them down into uh, <laughs> um, taking 
Eric, Eric set the system up for us, so otherwise we'd have never known what, what headings we're meant to put in. Now, we may be out of date in some of these, and we may need to have to update them a bit, but that's broadly what we've actually got. Uh, the bottom mammal is actually 25. Birds, I've made a mistake, it's actually 100, not 101. Uh, three reptile species. Uh, we have actually got four, but one's been intermittent. Um, the main reptile species we've got in there are slow worm, uh, common lizard, or viviparous lizard, and grass snakes. Now there have been historically adders in there and there was about four years ago an adder, I found two adders in the site, but I think somebody dumped them in there and we haven't found them since that summer. So I've not included adders in that there because I think it's, I don't think it's a permanent fixture and I think somebody put, put them in there. Uh, then there's the amphibians fish. Now, of course, the one thing that sticks out is how many insect species we've got there with over a thousand uh, insect species been, having been identified. Uh, and this is fantastic because normally it's the insect species that nobody goes looking for. Uh, and we have got a, a staggering number of insects um, uh, uh, found within the nature reserve. So I'm just going to flick on now from the animal list. And this is the insect list. And this perhaps gives you an indication now as to why we've got so many insects recorded. Because in red there, thanks to Howard, we have 631 fly species recorded, diptera recorded in at Vinters. There are only three other sites in Kent that have got more than we have. And I can't, I hold my hands up. It's nothing to do with me. It's all down to Howard. Um, but it just shows that if you let, give somebody, if somebody kindly gives you their time and you say, of course you, you can go there and you give them the opportunity to go and look for what they want, what is their passion, um, then, you know, Howard has been more than true to his word of giving us all his, his records. And there have been a number of firsts in there as well. Uh, bees, wasps, and ants. Again, I can't, you think do with me. Uh, that's down to Jeff and, uh, Jeff and Eric there. Um, beetles is a little bit on the lower side. Moths, moths again, this is down to Peter. Um, Peter did an awful lot of uh, trapping, particularly from about 2000 to 2006. Uh, butterflies is a fair representation of the butterflies that we get there. But you can see the one thing that absolutely sticks out is Howard's efforts, one man's efforts, virtually one man's efforts, uh, to get that species. When Howard got there, I think we had something like about 30 diptera species. So, you know, he really has rocket. And he still keeps, every year, he keeps finding more. Now, it's not that Vinters is a particularly fantastic space <laughs> um, for, for, for flies, uh, for diptera. It's just that he knows what he's looking for uh, and he has an absolute passion. So, yeah, there we go. In 1993, the Nature Reserve was designating an NNR, and that was down to um, that was down to Donald's uh, badgering and down to Eric's listing. Um, and so these were some of the notable species that were mentioned uh, in the LNR desi designation. And I think the reason that it got particularly some it was this particular woodlice species. Apparently, Eric said was very rare. And that was used as the uh, the creature to get us an LNR designation. Uh, and then there was having done this. So the desire in 1991 was to make it a nature reserve, to get an LNR designation. And Eric came up absolute trumps and went round there for the next two years, recording everything he could find. And of course, because he had the knowledge, he, he was then able to say what species there were of particular interest. And it helped us to get an LNR designation. Uh, and again, you know, this is just the power of, of a volunteer helping helping his community, his or her community. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. And that is the whole story of Vinters. It's, you know, it is not, um, it is there for the whole community to enjoy and for the whole community to be part of and, and contribute to. So uh, here we are celebrating 30 years, other matters of notes. First, um, first sighting Kent to record uh, that's down to Jeff. Jeff, that was you, I think. I'm sure. 1994, I think that, that's on there. It was on our list saying that was the, one of the first places in Kent to record it, and your name's down against it. So I'm giving you a thumbs up for that. Uh, we're number four in Kent for the number of diptera species. Okay, so this is my interest. Uh, so I'm not actually the president of Craig, I'm just the chairman. Um, too many pips on my shoulders there, you gave me time. Um, so it's a key amphibian site. And the reason being is because the lake is absolutely rammed with toads. 
and toads uh, numbers are dropping like a stone basically because the breeding ponds get polluted and so the lake is really important and you can go down there and I remember going around there with uh, Dr Lee Brady uh, many years ago uh, in May and we must have seen about 10,000 toad tadpoles swimming around the lake and we said at the time if this was the BBC if this was David Attenborough this would be a highlight to see this sort of number um, and it was wonderful to see. It's also a key reptile site because we have three species, slow worm, viviparous lizards and grass snakes. I'll come on to why we've got so many, so many reptiles in a minute. It's also fantastic for marble whites and other grassland butterflies. Um, that area that was a cow field, that number 11 that we managed for, for, for wildlife uh, as a conservation area, um, basically we do it by leaving it alone. Um, and over the years, it has turned from being a cow field into full of wonderful rank grassland, loads of nettle and bramble, which we love. And the marble whites, of course, come up, come up the HS1 route, uh, found it <laughs> over the space of about three years. We went from sort of half a dozen to if you go in there in June, and Ju if you go in there at the end of June, beginning of July, it's absolutely awash with them. And it, it's not that we put a sign up saying, come here, come here, Mr. Marble White. It's just they found the habitat. We're managing it rightly for them and they found it. OK, the management committee I mentioned. I think you will be hard pressed to find any other green urban area that has this amount of expertise on its management committee. So we've got Howard from the UK Dipter Society. You've got me from Crag. We've got Peter and Jackie and Ben from the Butterfly Conservation Area. We've got a number of dog walkers that come around there that are secretary and that of the RSPB. So we get information from there. We have a, a, a mates and camera club. Uh, wildlife subcommittee we had the kf the kemp field club um, uh, meeting on in 2013 we had the kemp back group with john so all these people just give us snippets on how we can manage it and how we can manage it for nature and what we should be doing to manage it in the proper way not to over manage it but what are the really vital things that we should be doing so for a local urban green space that most people think is only any good for dog walkers, you can see there's an awful lot of conservation going on there. And we don't blow our trumpet. We just get on with it. Um, we don't go around shouting and that about it. We just say, look, we're just getting on with it. It's our local bit. It's our bit of the planet that we're just trying to save for all those little creatures that, the other, that every other part of the planet is destroying. So recording into the future. This is my plug to you, Simon. This is the reason I said I'd do a talk for you. So we've got gaps in the recording, beetles and bugs. I just don't. We I just don't know a beetle and a bug person. So if you're a beetle and a bug person, I'll be really interested in you. Freshwater habitat, really difficult one to find the expertise in that. We've got lakes, we've got ponds. Since I've been there, I've got I've had eight ponds dug. Everybody told me you couldn't dig ponds; the water wouldn't turn up. I just ignored all that and got the ponds dug and lo and behold it rained and water did arrive. So freshwater habitat is a important habitat for us, but we don't have any knowledge on that. Fungi, as you saw, three on the list. There's more than that. Mosses and liverworts and lichens, there's, you know, it's, they're coming back. And I think the list that's on there is, is quite low. So if you are interested and you want to have free access to non-public areas where you can wander around to your heart's content to discover whatever it is that you love looking for, then contact me. Um, all we ask is you can go whenever you like and we just say, look, just share your records with us and tell us if we're doing things right and should we be managing it in a different way for your particular interest, just tell us and we will take on board like a sponge, whatever you have to give us. So if anybody's out there and you would like to go somewhere local and hunt around for the little animals and plants and creatures that you love, then come and see me. Just either drop me an email, I'll go on the website and drop me an email or, or send me a text and, and you'll be taken with open arms as, as Howard was and as Peter was and uh, Eric was and, and John was and, and Jeff was, you know, it's just part, we don't, you know, you don't have to, we don't ask any more than that. Just enjoy yourself there discover what you can discover and just share it with us and we'd be delighted so there we go however i thought i'd concentrate on a couple of areas of, of note uh, watman's meadow that was number 11 on that list that's the big 
area. It was the cow field for 200 years. It's our main conservation areas. Three ponds were added in February 2011, and it had a major reptile area release, uh, release in the area in the summer of 2011. And as I've said, 631 diptera species have been recorded there. Okay, major reptile release area. Okay, being part of Crag, um, before I became part of Crag, I was approached by Lee Brady. Um, there was a KCC highways team doing some work at an Ashford, at their Ashford depot, and they had some reptiles there, and they needed to find somewhere to put them. And one of our trustees worked for the KCC highways. So he got to hear about it. And Lee came and saw me in 2007 and we walked around to see if we'd got anything suitable. Now, I knew absolutely nothing about reptiles or reptile releasing, but Lee liked what he saw. And we had a bit of a chat about it. And I said, I'm not comfortable about Nature Preserve use it being used to dump animals in. Um, so we had a bit of a contretemps about this. And then we got to know each other and... Uh, we started off with a small release of, of slow worms and lizards into an area and Lee showed us what the potential was and so I started to manage the land for reptiles and so the cow uh, the cow field we just took the cows off ended the contract with the farmer because we were a nature reserve so well, why were we having cows on there so we just took the cows off and we just left it and we just left it for that was in 2009 uh, no, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, 2000, 2008, we just got, we ended the contract, we took the cows off and we just left it. We left it for three summers to just turn into <coughs> a suitable reptile habitat. Uh, actually, the reptile release was 2012, my, my, my apologies there. And so once we got the habitat, having left it alone for three summers, once we got it suitable for reptiles to be released, then I went on a major splurge and I put in 12 hibernaculums. This is not just silly log piles. This, this is 10 meter long, half a meter deep, filled full of bricks and rubble and wood. We actually, Lee told me he wanted bricks and he wanted half bricks and I couldn't get half bricks. I said, can't I just put builders rubble in? He said, no, I want half bricks. So we went and bought 20,000 bricks and me and my volunteers, broke the whole lot up with a hammer we all sat there with hammers it took us six weeks to break all these up and then we piled them into these into these hibernaculum on top of the 12 major hibernaculums we put into that field we also uh, put in 120 log piles sorry 110 log piles of which 55 were dug in and 55 were just logs on the top so again, it's not just chuck a load of logs on the top and let the grass grow half a meter, half an inch long and say, call it a reptile uh, release area. No, we, we managed that land for three years to make it a reptile. And having managed it as a reptile area, then um, it then became fantastic for uh, field voles. And having become fantastic for field, field voles, it then became great for kestrels. And so by managing it for, for, for reptiles, we would, actually turning it into a, a, a much better area for a whole load of other creatures and of course as we mentioned marble whites so this is the Watman's Meadow this is our main conservation area so this is an aerial shot um, so this is the field here uh, not the house there not that area there and that's private land but this area here going all the way up this is the nature reserve but it's a public area so this is the closed off area we people can go in and we just let the grass there's a couple of, there's paths to walk around but other than that that's the only bit of mowing i do other than that you can go in there so that's the aerial shot from it and that's just looking slightly to the right again so having having got all these reptiles and taking the developers money to do all this we then because we're a business our business is nature so promptly we got three ponds put in there and these became fantastic uh, and so what we did was I got um, uh, a contractor to come and dig the ponds for us. They're artificial ponds. And we left them. We just dug holes, lined them and left them. And then for uh, then for 12, 14 months, they never filled up because we were in the middle of a drought. And then in 2012, it didn't stop raining during the summer and they filled up and they've stayed filled up ever since. And what's been fantastic is we haven't put nothing in there. We just dug the holes and lined them and left them. 
And so what you get in there, nothing's been introduced there because the public can't get in there. There's no terrapins, no goldfish, um, because you can't get in there. Um, so whatever's in there got there under its own steam. We didn't put nothing in, but it gives you an indication. So that is uh, part of the aerial side of Watman's Meadow. So you see, you've got, you've got um, just over six acres there to wander around to your art's content. And this is at ground level. So there you can see, um, this is many years ago. So this is how, how we built our, our, our um, reptile hibernation uh, area, hibernaculums. So you can see we took the turf off, chucked all, dug a hole half a metre deep, threw a load of logs in there, threw all the bricks in, put the turf on top, and then it all come back, and then let it all come back. When we'd finished that field, it did look like the Somme, but yeah, nature, nature will repair itself and sort of, and it did. Uh, there's a lot of log piles around there as well. So when we cut down trees, when I'm doing me coppice in, you know, we take the logs, we build log piles with it. Um, you know, if you don't look after the little creatures, then you won't only big creatures. So we spend a lot of time looking after the little creatures at the bottom of the um, at the bottom of the pyramid. Okay, so whizzing on then to bats. I'm just conscious of the time. Um, so we've got seven recorded species. This is all down to John's efforts. Uh, seven recorded species in there. There are two winter hibernation sites. This is one of them. It's an ice house, uh, and uh, you can see there's, there's there's bars and grills on it. And then there's a steel plate on top there. And if you broke through all that lot, there's a 12 foot drop into some water at the bottom. So it's there to stop the stop people getting in and allowing the bats to get in. So the Kent Underground Research uh, Team put all this in for us. And the bats get in in that little gap up there and that little gap down there. And they fly in and they hibernate there in the winter. Uh, as I mentioned, John comes in twice a year in uh, January and February. Uh, and monitors them for the numbers of bats that are that are in the ice house and the and the uh, barrel bridge and in the summer evenings you can go around the lake and watch all the bats that are feeding around there that's the second um hibernation area so it's a barrel bridge so this is rag stone so this is the local stone and believe it or not it's all full of gaps there no mortar so they basically fly in there and get themselves jammed into the cracks and they stay there for the winter. Oh, I'm being a bit simplistic, but that's the gist of it. The bars were put on by John and the team to stop the members of the public in there because people were going in there and bonfires uh, and barbecues. So we stopped there and there's an entrance at the other end, which is locked uh, and nobody goes in there except John and volunteers for the Kent back group. And they come, so it only goes in there twice a year. That's the only time anybody goes in there. Um, I actually, last autumn because uh, John kept badgering me saying I'm pretty sure this will be an autumn swarming site so we managed to get a grant we put up two um two wildlife acoustic mini bat recorders in there where you can just leave them out uh leave them out for a month for a month on an end and they will do all the recording of the bats for you when you're fast asleep in bed so we put those out and John was right lo and behold this autumn last autumn we recorded natteras flying around there uh, swarming so it's a swarming meeting mating area and lo and behold in the winter we do get natural bats in here so we're really chuffed with that um, there was an article in the British Wildlife um, about uh, about bats uh, hibernation sites and swarming sites and what you often find is that the naturas that are going to that site they're like swallows they all turn uh, yeah only particularly certain animals certain naturalists only go to that site so that's their chosen place so that if that was to be destroyed the, the naturalists that normally go there they won't have anybody anywhere else to go so they'll have to go and find somewhere else so you know it's really important it's a lot yes i know it's only a local nature reserve and yes it's one of many uh, hibernation sites and swarming sites but at least we've discovered about it you know we go and get grants i got a grant from the Cobtree trust to get two of these and we said, look, this is why we want it. We want to encourage people. So we put them in last uh, in June. Uh, and I spent a happy summer identifying those. When I put one of those up for three days at the lake, I had six and a half thousand back rec recordings to, re to go through and work out what we got. And having gone through them all, I found an enthusiast pip pipistrel, three recordings of an enthusiast pipistrel, which we'd never had recorded in the reserve. When we put these up, what was amazing was and what um, we, we discovered whole areas of the reserve that we didn't know were good for bats, and we discovered areas in the reserve 
that were brilliant for bats between two o'clock and four o'clock in the morning when we were all fast asleep. So we discovered a lot and, and this is what we're, what we're aiming to do. Uh, and we've also built bat boxes. It's obviously those of you who know, this is the Kent bat box. We've got 25, uh, 31 of these up. Um, uh, local scout groups make them for us. We put them up, they come and have a look at them or they, you know, they want to know what's going on. And um, if you haven't used Kent bat boxes, they are brilliant. You got to leave them up for years. So we put them up and it took six years before the bats started to use them. But now when John comes and does the barrel bridge and hibernation, he goes and does about uh, 10 of these. And for the last, not this year, cause he couldn't do it, but for the last two winters previous to that, they've all had bats in. So, you know, they are really getting used by bats now. So they work and we're chuffed uh, for them to be there. Okay. The true legacy of the Watman and Repton era was the trees. 200 years ago, they were planted and we've got lots of trees now that have all got lovely, lovely holes in. Um, so there's some of the natives, some exotic, they're past parkland species, but they are wildlife treasures. So this is actually, um, this is a horse chestnut, um, so a conquer tree. Um, but there's, some of these trees are fantastic. I've got a lime tree avenue there, 200 years old. I put the bat detector up there last summer and lo and behold, every dawn and every dusk, I'm picking up a nocturne. So somewhere in one of those holes, there's a nocturne um, over uh, in the summertime avenue as a little home. Um, so it's that sort of thing that, that's, that's there. Okay, that's enough of me. Um, I've been wrapping this on for about an hour, but I hope it's given you an, an understanding of how important urban nature reserves can be, how important urban green spaces that most people would think Binters, nature, Binters Valley Nature Reserve is full of dog walkers. Well, it's not. Um, and we spend a lot of time trying to make it look scruffy, look full of brambles and nettles and broken bits of branches and trees that perhaps people say, oh, that's gonna come down. Well, no, it probably won't. Let's leave it and let it, let, it, let, it, let it go through its natural cycle. It's that sort of thing that we do. But what drives us the whole time is two principles. It's a home for nature and it's a home for people to re-engage with nature. Because if we're gonna save this planet from climate change and all the other problems that the massive human population is causing, People have got to discover nature for themselves. They've got to learn to love nature and then they'll protect it. And what better than a piece of green urban space on your doorstep where we are surrounded by people, but they are all potential David Attenboroughs. And that's the way we look at it. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me. I thank you for uh, watching the presentation. I hope that was okay. And I'm more than happy to take um, any questions that people have got. So Simon, back over to you. I will uh, unshare, um, how, do I, how do I unshare, uh, unshare that, and um, yes, uh, you can take it back, Simon, you can take, okay. take, take that back. Yeah, I actually managed to co-host, so we don't need to press Brilliant. any buttons. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, that was great, and um, yeah, the breadth of uh, content was uh, fantastic.